Good evening. My name is Stephen Ginsborg, and I'll be facilitating tonight's webinar, Non-Medical Supports and Programs to Improve Older Australians' Mental Health. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we've got around 1,500 people have registered to join us for tonight's webinar, as well as the viewers who are going to watch the recording. First, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet today on Aboriginal land, always was and always will be. And I pay my respect to elders past and present. First Nation cultures have flourished on this continent for over 80,000 years. And prior to 1788, people were in better health than by most of today's indicators of our health here in Australia. One of the ways that enabled families and communities to thrive were social structures based on mutual care and connection to country. Current social choices for addressing well-being have much to learn from First Nation cultures, including art, music and dance as some of these social choices. I also acknowledge the elders of other cultures who helped create the lively communities that are Australia. This webinar is the result of a unique partnership between 31 Australian primary care networks and the Mental Health Professionals Network, MHPN. In a first in their history, the 31 PHNs have formed a consortium and engaged MHPN to plan, produce and broadcast webinars focusing on older Australians and mental health. And tonight's webinar is the sixth and final of the series. We're hoping to continue the series into 2023. I'd also like to say a special welcome to the members of the Sydney North Older Persons Mental Health Network, which I'm a co-coordinator, and to the other networks around Australia who are meeting tonight to watch this broadcast. MHPN, are looking to expand its Older Persons Network program and are seeking expressions of interest from those who wish to join or lead an online or face-to-face -face network in 2023. We've put up uh, the QR codes if you'd like to uh, scan those. And in the resources, uh, we provided a flyer that you can download if you're interested. So we have um, given everyone the panelists' bios. Uh, so I won't go over them again, but we've got a slide coming up with the tonight's panel. That's a Colleen Doyle, search psychologist, Dr. Zara Thompson, music therapist, and Hilary O'Connell, occupational therapist. And there's a picture of me. And on the next slide, we have the webinar platform, which I'll let you just absorb for a moment. Um, you'll see that um, those three dots allow you to ask a question, and we will be monitoring those questions. We've had a lot of questions sent in beforehand, so we'll try and work through some of those, it's a very, it goes over three pages, the number of questions, and I've incorporated those into my questions that I'll be asking the panel. Uh, so hopefully you can go through all of those, ask a question, chat, and of course help if everything goes wrong. And if you need any technical support, don't hesitate to go into that site. By registering, participants have automatically agreed to the ground rules, which can be found in the supporting resources tab. Also, by way of the registration process, participants were asked to submit a question, and we going to refer to those. So... The aim 
is to discuss the evidence associated with using non-medical support programs to improve the mental health of older Australians living in residential aged care facilities and community settings. And appropriate to the festive season, we will be talking amongst other things about song and dance and art. So the learning outcomes are there. I won't go through them. You might like to look at them, and then you can you can uh, judge us severely when you you fill in your your assessment form at the end and say whether we met those learning outcomes. So I think we are ready to start the Q and A. Uh, and I'll start by asking Zara a question. Hi, Zara. Hi, Stephen. Hi, How are you? Very well, thank you. So uh, it's a broad question, but uh, I'll start with, with a broad question anyway, and we can go down to some of the detail. What is Mark? What is music therapy? Great question. So music therapy is an allied health profession and practice in which music is used by registered music therapists as the method or the tool to enact therapeutic change. So like a speech pathologist might work with um, speech and communication goals, an occupational therapist will use a range of tools, as I'm sure Hilary will talk about. In music therapy, we use music as the primary modality. And I'm sure many people joining in tonight will have had experiences where they've felt that music has been therapeutic for themselves or for someone that they love, um, you know, going to the gym, listening to music to help pump us up or perhaps listening to a, um, a sad song when we're in emotional turmoil. And music therapists basically use those kind of properties from music and also the neurological aspects of how music works in our brain to help people seeking therapeutic change. Well, that's a that's a, a a nice quick, and I think they call them an elevator pitch. You've <laughs> got that in between the, the you know ground floor and the and the fifteenth floor. Um, is there any, can anything go wrong? What are because you know a doctor will always say, what are the contraindications? Of course, yeah. So I guess um, music is in a silver bullet, and um, which is why we have music therapy and we believe that it's an important um, part of allied health. So music firstly is a really strong stimulus. It impacts a lot of our senses, not just auditory. If we're playing music with other people, we're using our tactile senses as well, our visual senses. And there's a lot of things that can be linked to music. So for example, emotions might be linked to music. Um, it might trigger some positive or negative memories and emotions as well that can connect to that. So we know from a mental health perspective, sometimes people might um, get stuck ruminating due to listening to the same song over and over again, and that can help to exacerbate um, some negative emotions and things like that. We also know that um, in my, my area of work, which is working with people who are living with dementia, that sometimes things like headphones, which I'm sure uh, many people might have seen examples of that, um, if anyone has seen the Alive Inside documentary, which shows a really powerful depiction of a person who is wearing headphones um, and suddenly is able to recall things and engage when previously they'd been sitting quite passively and not really engaging when people were talking to them. Um, while these are really magical effects and it's really exciting to be able to bring those to people, what I see a lot in my work is people with headphones on who might not be able to physically remove them. Perhaps they might have um, limited mobility. They may not have um, verbal communication anymore, so they can't yell out or call someone to ask them to stop it. And so that could lead to a range of um issues such as the volume being too loud, being really uncomfortable, causing headaches and things like that. It could, as I said before, trigger some really emotionally challenging memories or emotions that might leave them in a state of distress. So when we're using music, we're always thinking around around the, the positive benefits, but also what potentially could go wrong and how we might mitigate that as well. Great. Well, we'll come back and uh, you know, have the conversation about where 
where music therapy fits in and into the team that cares for people usually hopefully in the in the community so introducing hillary hi hillary hi Stephen. how are you good thank you um now you're an occupational therapist and you know a birdie told me you're rather keen on reablement <laughs> <laughs> I so certainly am. Because I think it's an, I think it's an, you know, it's, it's not a term that many people have heard. Yeah, well, it's certainly an area that I'm, I'm very interested in, Stephen. Um, and uh, I think to sort of a tiny bit of background behind it, I don't think I've got the elevator speech quite there in a very short <laughs> space of time. Um, but what we, we do know from a lot of the evidence is that most people as they age, want to stay in their own homes, in their own communities. And um, as we're living longer, people want to generally live those extra years in as good as physical and mental health and cognitive health as they possibly can. Um, but to live at home independently, you have to be able to do a certain amount of everyday skills such as moving, transferring, getting up and down steps, cooking, cleaning, various things like that to be independent and to sort of um, live well. And what we do know is loss of function in our later years is often down to fitness as much as anything, as opposed to, you know, a specific disease process. So there's there's a lot, so, so much we can do about it. So I've always been focused on what, when people are starting to receive community care, they're starting to want some low-level CHSP services, such as domestic assistance, gardening, meal prep, transport. What is it that we could be doing to enable them not to need those services? So particularly people at the beginning of their community care career, what we can, what can we do as a society and as a program to improve people's function, their strength, their balance, their endurance, their cognition as part of community care. And that's essentially what reablement is. I mean, it's been a, it's actually been in place for probably over 20 years in different countries and different contexts. Um, and in Australia since 1999, but it wanes due to the, the, the politics often of the country who's in charge, who, who fancies you know, talking about it in a different way. But essentially what it is, is a short-term targeted intensive service or an approach where you work with someone who's starting to struggle with their daily living activities and help them either regain that skill or learn another way of doing that skill or improve their fitness or their strength or help them with something like a piece of assisted technology or change the environment that they're actually living in to enable them to be able to do that activity themselves. So we've been retraining sort of community care organisations to try and think in this way. It's quite hard to change a culture in many ways, but more of a doing with approach rather than doing to someone or doing it for them. So we enable them to be able to do as much as possible for themselves. Um, and if I've got a moment, if I give an example of some things that I've sort of certainly seen is um, people who perhaps needed some personal care assistance um, and support workers go in, start help assisting someone to shower. But on the other days, the person showers themselves or they're able, you know, someone sort of turns up at the door to support someone and the personal care system grabs the arm and walks them down the corridor, lifts the arm, starts showering them. And yet the person's got out of bed, got dressed and made their own breakfast. So we have to sort of start thinking of changing that culture. And that's essentially what reablement is. It's outcome focused, short term intensive, getting the person to be the best they possibly can before any longer care decisions are made. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if the goal is autonomy, no matter what level of disablement uh, the person may be living with, um, you're re-abling. And, and is it mainly a program where you would train those who are working with the person rather yes. than going in and doing something yourself, like, you know, uh, the OT goes in and sets yes. up, yep. There's different. There's been different sort of research um, reports done on this, and certainly um, some of it's um, in some countries is multidisciplinary. But um, our argument has been that that's um, it's too expensive. It's not. It's uh, there aren't enough allied health to actually go around to be able to do that. So we've been very much training the support workers who are at the coal face 
to work in this way. And if they just think of it as of a, I'm going to be doing with this person and I'm going to be slowly doing less and less for them over time, then the approach works in that respect. So in some countries, in some areas, it's multidisciplinary, but from our perspective, it's more around working with community care organisations um, and support workers. And there's quite a lot of evidence, which um, Colleen might sort of um, uh, talk about, of reablement within residential care settings as well and the value of that and how it's actually improving people's um, mental, physical and cognitive outcomes. And it may be a, a theme that we'll come back to in, in the discussion because with the workforce shortage, obviously it's much more efficient to train people in That's skill. right. That's yeah. right. And um, I know you're going to come back to it. Part of a site that we've set up, which I'll talk about afterwards, is, is almost providing a um, virtual reablement um, platform for people certainly who um, have certain literacy levels to be able to sort of look at it and work some, through some of these things themselves. Yeah, we'll certainly come back to the, the joys of the digital. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, Colleen, welcome. Thank you, Stephen, and hello, everybody out there. <laughs> so, you've heard, of, you know, Hillary and Zara uh, discuss what, what they do. Um, I suppose as the, uh, everyone always wants to know what the evidence is, and we've got that in one of our learning outcomes. And as the, as the professor on the panel, you're going to tell us, hopefully, what is the evidence for some of these non-medical supports? Well, how many months have we got to talk about this? Oh, it's years, such a year. years. <laughs> It's such a huge topic that uh, we can't possibly cover uh, the the depth and the breadth of this of this area of research. But in a nutshell, yes, absolutely, there is evidence that non medical um, interventions can improve people's mental health and well being, whether they have um, are cognitively alert or they have some cognitive impairment or they're suffering from some some degree of dementia. And so the latest evidence is really that um, for a whole range of interventions that we can talk about from music and art therapy to uh, the sort of reablement th um, interventions that Hillary's talking about um, to physical activity, um, relaxation, sensory stimulation, um, environmental interventions, a whole range of evidence that all these things can help people to improve their, their quality of life and their mental health and well-being. The actually the strongest evidence that we've got so far is actually interestingly for music therapy. Um, so uh, Zara and her colleagues would, would know all about that research, but um, uh, certainly um, we did a um, an umbrella review published in the International Journal of Nursing Studies uh, last year to that looked at 26 systematic reviews and we screened thousands of reviews actually of um, non-pharmacological interventions for people with dementia, for example, and we found that um, interventions that were a combination of things really had the best evidence for making an impact on people with some cognitive impairment. Um, but absolutely, there's there's good evidence for all sorts of all sorts of interventions, and probably the takeaway message would be that the best evidence is for those interventions that are tailored to the individual, and that's probably why some of the evidence is a little bit patchy. So, for some things, for example, um, um, massage therapy. The evidence is not quite as good as for music therapy, um, but that may be because we're able to identify a music therapy um, more clearly than a massage therapy. Mm -hmm. So some of these some of these interventions that have been 
tested in the literature and in, in clinical trials in community settings and in residential settings um, are not terribly well defined, which means that it's hard to demonstrate that they work very well. Mm-hmm. And so that might be contributing to the to the evidence not being quite as as strong in some in some areas. Mm-hmm. But the good news is that you know there we we're at the stage of research now in the aged care area that we've got a whole lot of tools in our toolkit as far as how to to things to try to improve somebody's mental health and well-being. And it's a matter of um, testing them out in the field, testing them with individuals and seeing what the impact is for that particular individual based on the evidence mm. that mm. has been brought from the literature. Yeah. And this must be why the um, in, in, uh, in the UK, the uh, all-party parliamentary group for arts, health and well-being, can you imagine us getting one of those here? Not in yeah. a hurry yet, but hopefully. Let's, let's push for it. This is in 2017. Their key findings were the evidence that the arts can support longer lives, better lived, and can help to meet many of the challenges surrounding ageing including health, social care and loneliness and mental health. So, um, well, I think in the UK they had a minister for loneliness, didn't they? They do. Yeah. They still do, I think. We don't, yeah. we don't have one of those yet, do no, we? we but... let's, you know, we're advocating right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And certainly for sure, look, uh, Beyond Blue published a summary of interventions to help older people's mental health and well-being a few years ago, and and music and the arts was one of the strongest areas for evidence that they have a, have a good impact, more so in residential settings than in community settings. But as we shift more and more towards um, providing support um, for people in community settings, I think that literature will start to build as well, mm, so that mm. so that it's stronger. Well, the Royal Commission in their recommendation thirty eight certainly encouraged all of the modalities of uh, non medical supports, and they included uh, arts, art, and music therapists in there as well as part of the suite of services. So. You know, things are looking up. Um, just going to ask you all now maybe to comment on, in order to make these strategies sustainable, um, how we we can involve community, the wider community, uh, call them volunteers, call them peers, call them citizens, whatever, but how can we involve them in care of our older people? Can I answer that, Stephen? Yes, I'd want you all to answer it and, oh. and, and discuss it. Sounds <laughs> like an exam question. <laughs> well, it does a bit, um, doesn't it? <laughs> Look, we've been doing some research on befriending with volunteers for the last 10 years or so, and we've found... Um, very good evidence for an improvement in depression and anxiety among older people living in the community when they're provided with a new volunteer who makes regular contact with them on a weekly basis. Um, And uh, also in residential aged care, we have a we have a current clinical trial that's not quite finished, but we we are starting to recognise that we're getting good results in improving depression and anxiety among older people living in residential aged care by doing the same thing. And obviously this is not a substitute for a psychological intervention like cognitive behaviour therapy or some sort of professional therapy provided by a health professional, but it may be um, a good a good supplement to those sorts of professional interventions that are able to be put in place for people with depression or anxiety. And so I think, you know, we know that unfortunately during the pandemic, the rate of volunteering has gone down in the community as a whole. 
I know I saw an I saw an article the other day about op shops really struggling to attract volunteers to come in to help with op shop um, sales. And certainly in the aged care area, the community visitors scheme has also, I know, struggled to attract volunteers. But it's not it's not um, a pessimistic view. It's just that people are shifting the way that they're providing this sort of time. But certainly the, the evidence that we've been gathering has been really powerful that volunteering can be very good, a very good way to help older people. And in fact, it's good for the volunteers as well. We know that there are good mental health benefits for people who engage in volunteering themselves. Mm-hmm. So we need to get that message out there that um, it's good to um, make new friends. Yep. So places yep. like organisations like Friends for Good, and there are all sorts of organisations like that in various states. I know in WA, Hillary, there's one called Be be a friend or be mm-hmm. friend, something be friend. like that. Be friend, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, those sorts of organisations are starting to pop up in yeah. all the states yeah. and it's a yeah. terrific way to help older people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I've got a yeah, few, few examples that I could talk about. Certainly this was quite a while ago now at a large organisation I worked at over here. We um, researched and piloted something called social enablement, which sounds sort of a bit sort of um, medicalized, but it it wasn't supposed to be. And that was engaging with um, clients, well, older people who were already clients of the organization, asking them to volunteer to be part of a social enablement program to work with other older people who were lonely, not getting out, were um, becoming quite depressed and anxious. And um, we matched them all up. Um, and it, it worked. Ex- it worked extremely well. That's a very good outcome. So I don't think it was ever written up, unfortunately. Um, but what we found is that the the people who were acting as the volunteers they actually came off home care after a while because they improved their well being and both from a physical perspective and social and mental, they improved their own well being so much that they actually said, "I don't think I need to be supported by your organisation anymore," which was. A real win-win, which is something we hadn't thought of at that time. So yeah. I thought that was that was such a good way of going about it. That's great. Yeah, you, you need us to help you evaluate that, Hillary. Exactly. It was a long time ago, <laughs> and okay. I'm not at that organisation any minute. But it, that really worked. It was a surprising result. Um, and I, the other thing I was thinking of, Stephen, um, was uh, the village hubs. And I know you're, you know, that everybody's got a different opinion about the village hubs that have been set up but essentially the village hubs are um, certainly the ones that have been set up recently the 12 that have been set up across the country with government funding are essentially to um, for people who to who who volunteer to help actually set up the hubs themselves so they're part of the driving committee behind it so it is there to attract people who um, have experienced an element of loneliness that who want to improve their well-being and by them being engaged in the development of the hub to me that has multiple um, ripple effects from a, their own perspective, but also for the people that they're attracting to that hub. Um, and again, that hasn't been evaluated yet, but it will be within the next six months. Um, and that's working very well yet. So it's attracting mm-hmm. people to it who are volunteers, um, who, are, who are getting very positive outcomes from mm-hmm. that. Um, and can I say one more thing? Yeah, we've got too lot. Something uh, no. on the the site that I talked about that we were were developing. We've been engaging older people to be part of the co-design process. Mm. So they've been helping us design the look and the feel and the content. And we've also taken that across now to First Nations people and people from multicultural backgrounds to ensure that the content works for them. Um, mm. and is relevant to them. And that's sort of a people who are volunteering and, and they're finding that actual co-design process to be part of the design of something that's about them for them has been really important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think the idea of um, a larger uh, sense of kindness comes from you know, the idea of kith, uh, kin and kith, kith and kin. You know, we, we, we are a community and uh, 
we can all help support each other. Some would call that idealistic, but uh, it's surprising how quickly change can occur. Yeah, yeah. I'm idealistic. I always think you should start with that. <laughs> I, I think it's a good starting position. <laughs> I think so too. Someone, someone in the um, in the in the uh, audience, Ohana. I hope I haven't um, mispronounced your name. Can you get aged care funding for music and art therapy? Yeah, you can. Sometimes it depends um, what kind of package people have. So we know that the My Age Care packages can be used for music therapy and art therapy, but it really depends on the level of support package that someone has and um, I guess the access that they have to finding someone and to, mm. to linking in with the right people. Sometimes it could be that the person helping them manage their package hasn't heard of music therapy or art therapy or other creative therapies or might see it as... Um, they might hear it but assume that it's not an allied health profession. So that can be a bit of a barrier sometimes. Mm. Um, but And I can't speak for art therapy directly because I'm not an art therapist, but for music therapy, we have a directory of music therapists on our association website, which will be in the resources that I've provided. Um, and I believe Anzacata, which is the um, Art Therapy Association for Australia and New Zealand, also has a similar function on their website as well, which I can also share to um, the MHPN team to share around as well, if that's something people would like. Um, so was, yep. Sorry, Stephen, I was, just, I was just going to ask Sarah whether um, attending a choir would be considered as music therapy because we were involved in an evaluation of a community choir for people with dementia a couple of years ago and I know that the family carers who brought along the person with dementia that they were caring for were able to pay somehow through the community aged care funding that they were getting for attending the choir. It was a fantastic choir. I loved yeah. it. It was a lovely project. Was that alchemy in Canada? It was, no, it was a necto in, in ah. uh, Melbourne. Ah, right. Oh, that's yeah. a, yeah, I'm not sure if they're still around. So yeah. um, it's funny that you mentioned that because that happens to be my PhD research topic. So, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So I, I currently facilitate the Rewire Musical Memories Choir, which started as a research project led by my PhD supervisors. And then when the research ended, I took over and then somehow got roped back into research and we did a PhD together with my choir, which was really beautiful. Um, we'll hopefully have a publication from that coming soon. Um, probably not for a few months, but it's under review at the moment. But we have a few other um, publications that are in that resource thing that I did as well. But one of my big passions is community choir singing. Um, to your question as to whether it can be considered music therapy, from a funding perspective, um, we have had some success with people using their packages accessing community choirs. Again, it depends on the location and the amount of funding that they have and things like that, but it seems to be relatively accessible. I'm currently working with a few different choirs around Australia, actually, some of whom are music therapy led like my own and some of whom are community led. Um, so we don't like to gatekeep who can do music and who can, you know, have choirs and things like that. So we're starting a network called the Dementia Inclusive Choirs Australia Network. Again, website is coming soon. We've actually spent the afternoon working on it. It's quite hard to build a website apparently. Oh, yeah. But um, yeah, there's so many wonderful, wonderful choirs around the country um, that are inclusive for people living with dementia and family members too. What my research and other research show, has shown is that the choir singing, going back to that um, previous question around what communities can do to support people living with dementia, um, choir singing can can create its own community within within the choir itself. It's an accessible way for people who might have difficulty engaging in conversations or perhaps they've got aphasia due to their dementia um, or they might just have difficulty, you know, focusing for a conversation. It's a really beautiful space where they can be included and participate and work towards a goal together at the same time without needing to have that explicit conversation and there's all the wonderful things like emotional expression, we're bonding, we're getting lots of endorphins and hormones released mm. when we sing as well. So, so many wonderful things that can come through to that. But um, what my research also found was that stigma is a huge contributing factor to negative 
mental well-being or psychological well-being, um, that the stigma of having dementia and even the stigma of being older has been a huge impact on the people that I work with in terms of their well-being and their quality of life and their their mental and emotional states. Um, people will talk about once having received a diagnosis that um, people cross the road and don't come and talk to them from their local communities because they assume that they can't anymore. And one thing our choir in particular, and I know the other choirs around Australia, like the Alchemy Chorus in Canberra and um, Good Life Chorus in Sydney, have done a really amazing job at um, using the choirs as a, a means for in a, engaging the wider community. So performing at local events, um, we were able to do pre-COVID lots of events where we would go and sing and invite other community groups to perform as well and really help to showcase the talents of our participants and show mm-hmm. that even if you have a diagnosis of dementia, you're still able to do things and you're still mm-hmm. able to be, you know, contributing to your community too. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that addressing that stigma, whether it is, you know, going to a concert um, or going to an art show produced by um you know, people living with dementia. I know there was a really great one. I forget what it was called. Hillary, you might know, in Western Australia for younger onset dementia who are artists and they did a, a virtual exhibition. It was really incredible. But the arts are... I can't remember the name. Mm. I can't remember the name, but, yeah, no. there, there's some really um, fantastic accessible nice. um, medium through art, I guess. So that would be my my contribution to that. I, I <laughs> yeah. saw a lovely uh, uh, program in the UK, it's from Bingo to Bartok. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's a th- I'm wondering. There wasn't, if- there wasn't the one with Angela Rippon, was it? I think it was. <laughs> Could have been. Is that what most, most people in Australia wouldn't know who Angela Rippon was. <laughs> uh, can, um, I just I'm wanted to say something the, there, the, just yes. out of interest, um, from just coming back to Zara, I have a, um, a friend who, who lost his wife um, probably four years ago now, and he, he has um, dementia, but he's been using his home care package, and he had some sort of surplus funds, or he wasn't using it for other things, um, and he's using it to attend a choir, and not only, say, has it improved his mood, but also he, he's got this whole network of people now who pick him up and take him other places and they have coffee afterwards and things like that. But it's also improved his breathing tremendously. Just so that from a respiratory perspective has been really, really good for him. Um, and he also, even though people in the audience may not want to know this, he also actually, he's going using it to go to the pool as well. Mm. So there are options if you if you're, if you know sort of what to ask for in some respects on whether you actually have the funds available to use those packages and to use those funds for what you sh- you really find value in. Well, the evidence is that if, um, if, if you improve your connectedness and reduce your social isolation in the way that you're talking about, Zara, and, and I think that we're all discussing mm. this as, as groups, um, all, of, all of your chronic disease manifestations, cardiovascular, dementia, uh, renal, mm. they all improve as well, mm. of course, your one's mental health, mm. sometimes by up to 30%. So yep. if there was a medication on the market that improved things by 30%, everyone would be talking about it. But, That's right. So, That's so right. There is a question from the, from, uh, from the audience um, which comes to the issue of, of groups. Uh, can any of the panel please talk about the role of therapeutically informed groups? Now, yep, I'm getting a, a nod from Zara. <laughs> I can, but I'm aware I've spoken a lot lately, so would anyone That's else right. like to <laughs> jump in? Or... <laughs> no, no, you go for it. <laughs> um, was, there, was there more to that or just No, just uh, that's, can any of the panel talk about the role of therapeutically informed groups. And I, I like the idea of groups because they're more sustainable, mm-hmm. cost less if you're attending a group. Absolutely. And I think particularly for older people and um, the I, one of the participants in my study did mention that they, their circle of community and their social groups are shrinking because people are getting old and they're dying or they're um, moving away into care and they're not able to connect anymore. So I think that any type of group is is really beneficial. I think, um, and I know, Stephen, we had a bit of a chat about this before we came on, but the the idea of what is therapy and what is fun and how do we 
um, how do we balance that and what are we policing or gatekeeping it, I guess. So, and I, this is something that I, you know, wrestle with a lot as a music therapist. And I think for me, um, I use, I like to use the analogy of another allied health profession. So I, um, for example, um, if you're wanting to work on a physical goal, you might go to the gym and join a class there and you might experience some physical benefits and social benefits from being in the class. And, um, that, is no doubt really therapeutic for you. However, if you need a little bit of extra help because you've got a specific goal that you want to work on or there's um, a problem or an issue that you want to resolve through therapy, then going to a, a physiotherapy group would be more appropriate. And I see it the same for music therapy. So mm-hmm. even though I run my choir, I don't see it as a therapy group, although many of the members would argue that it is very therapeutic. Um, But I also run targeted therapeutic groups, which is smaller. We work on more personalized outcomes and things like that. So I think those, that's the distinction. And I know a lot of people in the disability community also talk about their frustration that non-disabled people get to do music and gardening and art, whereas disabled people get put into horticulture therapy and music yep. therapy and yep. art therapy. So I think for me, seeing it as a continuum and that doing all of those things as leisure without the therapeutic design is really yep. helpful. And as we've talked about, will have incredible effects as well. And then for people who need that additional level of support, perhaps a more targeted therapeutic group could be more helpful. So I hope yep. that, that helps. Yeah, no, that's that great. Yeah. I, can I move the discussion to... Uh, the the topic of the uh, of, of this uh, more than decade this uh, century probably which is the digital. What's the role of of uh, digital modalities in what in the areas we're discussing tonight? Okay, um, I don't mind sort of talking from my perspective on this. Yeah. Um, I guess so for, as as a as a occupational therapist who you know I've been working over sort of um, forty years now, um, and recognizing more and more that the you know there's a growing population, potentially reducing workforce to not everybody's going to be able to get to see a occupational therapist, a physiotherapist, a music therapist, however much value we may be. Even in groups, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. People aren't going to be able to access um, who they want to when they want to, and so I think there's a the digital world can really help for for some people. It's not for everybody by any means, um, but I think if the if we can provide digital information in a format that, as I said before, is being co-designed, that is relevant to people, um, that is. Um, transparent and and non-biased as well and um, can help them through stages and and help them with some of their decision making around what what are they looking for are they looking for things that will help build their social connections are they looking for people for for things that will help their mental well-being or their physical well-being Um, what exactly are they looking for then I think there's a a place for a digital platform to be able to do that Um, but I think you've always got to be wary about what's out there and um you know what what the caveat behind it has it been written by health professionals um is it anybody out there putting anything in there you know is there any risk attached to any of that so there's an awful lot of information out there and a lot of information overload as well um but i think there's a a real role for it particularly uh, even more so in rural and remote areas um uh, where people don't have access to other resources and services um that might support them yeah, certainly you can get funding through your your package mm. for, for for devices. That's right. Lee, yeah. What we found in our research during the pandemic is that we've had to offer digital alternatives to face to face interventions, and certainly we found that. Um, connecting people via Zoom like we're doing now or over the phone even or through some, through a video screen um, is certainly better than nothing. It's, not, it's, it's a connection of some sort, but it's not, it's not as good as, as person to person. It's not. And 
the older people that have been involved, involved in our research, a lot of them have preferred a face-to-face um, mm. contact um, for that social connection. Absolutely. But when they, when they obviously during lockdowns and so on, um, a digital connection is better than nothing. And mm. the other, the other point I'd make is that from the point of view of um, learning about health literacy, learning about interventions that, learning about dementia even, um, we've just um, recently completed a trial of, of uh, training for aged care workforce um, in the community about dementia and we found that, um, again, the face-to-face training was much preferred by the, the workforce as well. Mm-hmm. Um, they liked the online training because they could do it in their, you know, in their spare time or when they had a spare moment um, and they could do it on their phone if they wanted to rather than having to, to go to a special mm-hmm. session. But, in fact, the results were better when it was face-to-face than when it was online. Yeah. Um, they learnt more when they were face-to-face and they had that sort of extra social connection. Mm-hmm. And it was more fun doing yeah. it in person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, we found exactly the, the same with some training we've done previously around um, supporting people to be more independent and reablement and how it works, um, say, in the support worker role uh, to have people face to face where you chat through scenarios and you can relate to someone and say, well, in your circumstance, this is how it might help you. And then problem solving together brought everybody together with some really good ideas and brainstorming. And online, it just wasn't just yeah. wasn't the same. It felt more of a, a tick off process, if that yeah, sounds maybe, right. Maybe we haven't really learned how to do the online thing no, as no, well we haven't. yet. Mm. I mean, so things like the MOOCs, the massive online courses, uh, mm. have really fantastic take-up yeah. and yeah. people do do them. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I think we've got a way to go in learning learning how to have a good substitute for that good old yeah. face-to-face. Mm. And I think, Zara, you would know this literature more than me, but I think real live music is better than digital music isn't it yeah outcomes <laughs> yeah well um it's funny you say that because again that was part part thanks to COVID of my PhD research as well and um what we found from our study with my choir so we all went online and I guess one thing I want to say before I forget is not to underestimate the ability of older people to use technology I oh, think yeah. at the start of mm-hmm. the lockdown none of my Absolutely. choir members or most of them had never done a video call one didn't even have the internet or a smartphone and by the end they're all using iPads and laptops and even now because COVID is still a threat and um, because our participants are vulnerable, we have a hybrid model. So people who are either not feeling safe or who maybe are having symptoms um, and can't attend in person can come online at the same time and that's been the hybrid model has been really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, What our research kind of found was that there was the the kind of magic of singing and that singing in unison we can't do on Zoom. We have to have one person singing and then everyone else on mute basically, which is really tricky because um, that that kind of social bonding that happens when we sing is missing and that kind of magic of all doing something at once, which I think is really powerful. And we know that when we sing together we get um, oxytocin released um, the hormone that helps promote social bonding. So that that wasn't mm. happening. I don't know about the hormone side. I didn't measure that, but <laughs> that's what people were reporting is that they missed that kind of connectivity. But they did find actually in some respects it was really accessible for some people. And in another study by my colleagues who were doing um, Parkinson's, uh, the song, sorry, the Parkinson's song choirs online, they found that actually um, sometimes for some people that could be quite helpful because they could see the mouth moving and they could see themselves up close and for working on speech and communication goals that was actually really beneficial rather than sitting in a big group in a room with everyone they could kind of see themselves um and see the the kind of mechanics of what was going on which was really helpful for them so I think there's a lot of um yeah pros and cons and as you said I don't think it quite replaces in-person singing but definitely still something that people can enjoy and can get a lot out of, yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's a that's a great summary of the the benefits and some of the pitfalls of digital. 
so as they say, moving forward. Um, the Royal Commission showed up many um, of the difficulties of caring for people with distressed behaviours, whether it be in community or in aged care facilities. So I'm, I'm wondering, what's the evidence for the use of non-medical supports for people with distressed behaviour? We doctors are very much discouraged to use medication anymore, and that's as it should be. But, um, you know, Colleen, do you... Do you know the evidence for that ex more extreme behaviour rather than day-to-day um, uh, -day distress or no, well, the, the, clinic, the clinical guidelines for people with dementia and how to handle the more extreme challenging behaviours still recommend trying psychosocial interventions first because mm. of the difficulties with uh, side effects and so on with with um, pharmacological interventions. And so even things like um, vocal vocal dis vocally disruptive behaviour, um, which is something that happens when people are uh, moderate have moderate to severe dementia, um, can be successfully improved by, for example, a music intervention. Um, um, I've done some research in the past showing that uh, noise making for individuals can be improved and the person can be calmed down by a music intervention that is tailored specifically for that person. Um, and so the best evidence is really to, um, if we look at uh, clinical pathways for treatment of um, behaviour, behavioural and psychological symptoms of dementia, um, the recommendations are all, always to try psychosocial interventions that are tailored to that individual based on a very careful assessment of their history um, and their environment, the um, situation that they're living in, the training of the of the individual people looking after the person and so on. And the combination of all of those, all of those factors can actually have quite a big impact on the distressed behaviours that are being exhibited by the person. Mm -hmm. um, so it's so much evidence such of interest around pet care. Sorry to, to ask you a question. You know, I, um, there's a lot, I love animals and there's um, been yes. a lot of dogs and other animals. I think I even saw a lamb not long ago um, yeah. and chickens going into residential care. And I, I, I love the idea of that personally. Yes. Um, there's, is a, there... there's, been, there's been some studies of, of uh, if you want to call it, animal-assisted therapy. <laughs> 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 um, but sure, there's some good evidence in residential settings and in community settings for an improvement in depression, for example, um, yeah. through providing visits by pets. Obviously not for everybody. Some people no. hate, 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 hate pets. Mm. Um, but for sure, uh, I think, I think uh, for, as I, as I said before, you know, all of these, all of these interventions do need to be person-centred and they need to be taking into account the likes and dislikes of the individual. Mm, absolutely. It's not, it's not mm. something that you can, um, it's not like Panadol. You can't just give the same thing to everybody. Um, so yeah. it does need some careful some careful assessment before, yeah. before designing a, um, a social intervention. Um, no, knowing the the life narrative is so important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And speaking with family and involving yeah, the family. Yeah. That's your way and knowing forward. knowing what that particular individual found meaningful and you know, what gave them the the mm. ikigai, you know, the mm. reason to get up in the in the morning. Mm. Yeah. Um and and uh, reflecting on how that can be can be changed in some way to accommodate their their reduced abilities, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but following along the same flavour of the of what made them a person um, in the past, and and trying to trying to honour that that history of the individual. Of course, sometimes people who are making a noise or disruptive 
are taken away from the social situation and the connectedness. And I'm wondering what the research is for, for doing quite the opposite, to increase the social connection, because the person may indeed be feeling very lonely, which we know causes great distress. It may well be. I mean, there's a, there's some research about the built environment and about the effect of overstimulation, so-called, mm-hmm. on people with cognitive mm-hmm. impairment, you know, mm-hmm. that, that perhaps a noisy environment might be distressing to somebody mm-hmm. with dementia mm-hmm. and so putting them somewhere that's quieter um, might help them to relax yeah. more. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. as, you, as you say, you know, um, we really need to become c- citizen scientists, don't we, to try mm-hmm. to work out a systematic way to approach these mm. approach these these situations and to to um, make a careful analysis of of what the triggers were for the for the behavior that has arisen um, and to reflect on well how can we change those systematically and mm. and what what are the outcomes that are the, the best ones that we need yeah. to measure. And you use those sort of scientific tools mm. to to have a systematic way to to address these issues. Uh, that's mm. really the only way that we can improve the evidence base in general, and also mm. improve the care for individuals. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think if one one of you mentioned um, tailoring uh, what what we do to support people. Uh, must be very culturally uh, aware and uh, appropriate. So I'm wondering if if any of you can give your experiences of where that's either been a challenge or or where um, we we're, we're four monocultural people here pretty much, and um, how do we how do we meet the needs of First Nations and other cultures. Mm. Well, at the National Aging Research Institute, there's been some wonderful research programs um, being conducted with First Nations people in the Northern Territory. Um, if you look on their website, there's some information about some Pitjantjara um, community work that's been done with with art uh, being prov- produced by the elders in those communities and the impact of that on the the elders' well-being and so on. It's a fantastic area to work in. I'd love to go and see see them. Um, mm-hmm. And we've also been providing um, befriending in different languages for people from different cultural backgrounds and found that um, there are different attitudes in different cultural communities as far as... Yeah. Bringing, yeah. a, bringing a visitor in, whether it's um, a feeling of mistrust of, of a stranger coming into the community um, in some situations, but in other situations a feeling of um, being able to connect with someone from the same culture and very quickly, very quickly connecting uh, because mm. they felt as though they understood each other. Um, mm. Mm-hmm. It's very important to to respect those sorts of those sorts of cultural differences. Yeah, we certainly found from a, a community care Raven perspective, different cultures have a different um, way of thinking about how. Um, someone should be supported as they get older and that not uh, um how do we say not supporting someone or, or not doing their shopping for them not doing things for them was actually very disrespectful and you know w- there we are sort of saying look we need to enable this person to be able to do as much as possible for themselves because they live well for longer uh, but you've got the family saying no that's not what, how we work in our society we if mum wants a cup of tea we're there we're going to get up and make it for her. We're not going to suggest she makes it for her so she'd move a little bit more. Or if that's what mum and dad want, that's what we're going to do for them because that's the culture in which that um, we we work. Um, I'm, I'm 
married to an Italian, so I can say that myself within the Italian culture <laughs> of certainly some older ladies of, of Italian ladies when they're around 70, 80, it's just like, right, I'm sitting down now. People are going to just do everything they possibly can for me because I've been working since I've been 12 or 15 sort of thing. So very different culture in that respect to, um, you know, your, your, your other cultures that might say absolutely want to be independent. We, we, we want to do what we want to do for ourselves. We don't want any help from anybody. It's quite different. Mm -hmm. Perhaps have a great place to play in this mm. located in a culturally specific area. Yes, yeah, and there are, there are the, the different hubs have been set up, but through different groups as well to mm. support different different groups of people. Mm. Um, you know, whether they're sort of First Nations or LBGQI, they're sort of different groups, different multicultural groups as well. So it's going to be very interesting to see um, how they're set up, the sorts of services and programs they're running, and, and the evaluation from all of those. And the hope that uh, it'll be leadership by stepping back, is there? I, I hope so. That's certainly what the expectation is, and over time for them to be self-sufficient. That's it. That's it. So, yes. Sarah, what have you had experienced in the multicultural? Um, I guess there's a lot, of, a lot of angles we could look at this from, from a music perspective. Obviously, um, coming back to tailoring things to meet people's personal preferences, understanding their cultural background and what that relationship with music might be, what's appropriate, what's not, and things like that. When it comes to running a community group and how we might balance people, a different um, people's cultural backgrounds and preferences within that group can be really challenging. And for me as a white Australian person, I need to do a lot of reflexivity and perhaps sometimes talking to people from other communities around how I might help support the people in my choir and knowing that I don't always have the answer. And if something occurs in, in that group session where I'm perhaps unsure of how to deal with it, because it's um, like Hillary was saying, it's, it's something that's a very different cultural experience to what I'm used to. I might seek support from someone who does have that cultural background to kind of discuss. I think also um, as a clinician and as a researcher and part-time academic, I think we have a responsibility as well to look at where, are, why aren't there more diverse clinicians and what can we do to support people um, from more diverse backgrounds to become clinicians and to, to work with um diverse communities as well. So not just thinking around what I can do personally, but what what can I do to support um, having more people from diverse backgrounds into the system as well. And on that note, I guess um, when we're talking about diversity in this field, also recognising that a lot of people who work as support staff are from a range of diverse backgrounds and, you know, mm -hmm. some people are on um, migrant visas as well and thinking about mm -hmm making sure we're taking that into account when we're working at upskilling and transfer yeah. of skills as well and being respectful around that too. Yeah. Great. Great. So we're coming near the end and um, sort of time for summing up some thoughts. We, we never have a, enough time to fully go into the depths of all of your areas of speciality, but um Colleen, would you like to kick off and just sum up what you've some of what you've heard tonight, the take home messages as they call them? Well, I think the take home message from my point of view is really that there's good evidence for non medical interventions to improve older people's mental health and well being. Um, but we do need to consider it um, as something that is tailored to the individual and there's, it's not a one-size-fits-all. So, And also that um, because of that, we all need to think about how best to improve the evidence when, we, when we're thinking about the individual and to have a systematic evaluation of the impact of the interventions that we're trying for individuals. Mm -hmm. Hillary? Okay. My, mine's probably similar, but I'll phrase it a different way, hopefully. Um, 
similar sort of thing that with the you know the evidence is there to say that working with people um in a reabling or restorative way works that it again improves people's physical mental and social um well-being and outcomes um we know that people um want to live well for longer and it's sort of that old ed age um you use it or lose it really does apply that I think within the community care sector um, we need to help people build reserves so that they are as resilient as they possibly can be as things come along and you know knock people about a little bit whether it's loss of a partner whether it's a disease process so that we need people to have some reserve in that and I think um we know that age-related decline is malleable and we can do quite a lot of it uh, ourselves to enable us to live well for longer. And I think it's uh, the community care sector and the Royal Commission themselves have sort of said, you know, we need to be working with people in a way that's not task-oriented, that it's actually building people's capacity or at the very least not taking away from someone's capacity. Uh, how we do this in a community care sector that's under stress currently um, you know, workforce demands, the new reforms coming in and that side of things is is, is a, a tough ask because we do need everything to be tailored, personalised and individualistic for it to make a difference. Uh, so I think from my perspective, I've always tried to sort of see from a OT is, is, is what I'm doing when I'm working with this person at any time, taking away from something that they could do for themselves that would improve their well-being or am I helping build their capacity? So am I building the capacity from what I'm saying and what I'm doing, or am I taking away? And if we've got that in our head, and every time we're working with someone and thinking about what we're saying and physically with them, what are we doing and what's the impact of our own actions on them as well? Yeah. Would you say the same applies, especially given the workforce issues, a reablement of community and the the strengths that that live in the community. To, Absolutely. To Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. What the, 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 the connections that are out there, that reablement of bringing back community that supports community, I think are really, really important. Mm. There's a place for compassionate communities. There is. Absolutely. Sarah, sing us um, a song to, to round up. <laughs> As, um, I think the appropriate song be would be I get by with a little help from my friends, isn't it? <laughs> um, I really I, I echo what um, Colleen and Hilary have both said. I think that that community connection and um, making sure that things are tailored to what someone needs and likes and enjoys and is interested and motivated by is really essential. And I think, um, Hilary, you mentioned quite a few times tonight, the idea of co-design and mm -hmm. involving people. And even just within this panel, as we're talking about, you know, the rather monoculturedness of this panel are also, um, you know, I mean, I know we talked a bit about age before we came on air, but, but we also don't have panelists who are, um, you know, in their seventies and eighties. And I think that's a, um, you know, when we're talking about what we can do to support the community and address stigma, which is a big um, barrier to people and to people accessing supports, particularly when it comes to age related mm -hmm. um, illnesses and conditions. I think also making sure that we're listening to people with lived experience, listening to our elders and ensuring that, um, you know, that we're having these conversations with people who are going through it and, and sharing their perspectives as well. And as clinicians, yeah. I think that's something we can all continue to do. Great. Thanks. Well, thank you to to all three of you. Uh, it's it's been very enjoyable speaking with you, and uh, perhaps see you again on a on a subsequent webinar. That'll be great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen, and thanks everyone. So, um, in conclusion. Mental Health Professional Networks supports the engagement and ongoing maintenance of practitioner networks, where clinicians from different disciplines meet regularly with other mental health practitioners, share tips and resources, build local referral pathways, and engage in CPD activities. So feel free to contact uh, uh, the MHPN. Uh, we've got a slide up there. 
Um, of course, it's not just older people who benefit from social connection. We healthcare professionals also benefit from connection. And uh, so that's one of the great strengths of local networking. Uh, on a larger scale, in, in um, 2023, um, the MHPN, uh, there's the slide, will be having a conference, an online conference called All Together Better. And that's between the 28th and the 30th of March. Uh, registrations are now open and the address is on the slide. I uh, like the, the subhead, Collaborative Mental Health Care in a Changing World. And uh, I look forward to that very much. So it's time to encourage you to fill out the exit survey by scanning the QR code of your mouse at the top of the screen. Click the banner. A uh, statement of attendance will be sent to you in the next four weeks, and you'll be sent a recording of the webinar when it becomes available. So I always tend to end a little bit early. Um, uh, so be it. Uh, thank you, people. <laughs> thank you all for your participation. Uh, travel safely over the Christmas period. And uh, I think the encouragement from tonight is, um, is sing, dance, uh, decorate your Christmas presents, and um, keep active. So enjoy Christmas and the new year or whatever festival you may celebrating and uh, hope to see you in the new year. Thank you for coming.